Hello, and welcome to the UGA Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts and Sierra Nevada panel. Today, I'll be moderating a conversation on community with two fabulous uh, community members. One, uh, Matt Stevens, who will introduce himself in a second, and the other, Sierra Grossman, who will also introduce herself. My name is Grace Bagwell-Adams. I'm on faculty in the College of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management, and I also run the Athens Wellbeing Project. And in addition to that, serve as our Assistant Dean for Outreach, Engagement, and Equity in the College of Public Health. So it is my great honor to be here with both Matt and Sierra, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sierra Grossman, and I am with Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Uh, my current role here is Vice President of the company. Uh, we are family owned and operated, and I am actually a second generation family member here. Um, my father founded the company in 1980, and we just celebrated 40 years this past year. And my name is Matt Stevens, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic Impact at Creature Comfort Brewing. We have not been around for 40 years. Um, we've been around for about going on to seven, but we, um, just like Sierra Nevada, we are a company who seeks to be a, a business as a force for good. And so that's what my Department of Strategic Impact is really committed to is, I guess, distinct from the core business, which is brewing and selling beer. We are the team that tries to figure out how are we as a local craft brewery uniquely positioned to add benefit to the folks around us. And so that's what my team does at Creature. Thank you both for those introductions. We're just going to jump right into the questions. Um, so again, these questions are really centered around community and the community engagement that both of your companies engage in. So the first question here is that both Sierra Nevada and Creature Comforts were really built on the belief that companies should contribute to their communities. So I would love for you to tell us about this and specifically about how your brewery launched its corporate philanthropy. Yeah, so it, it was the community that helped support uh, our foundation and um, just our ability to be a business. For us, being part of the community was giving back, whether it be financially, beer, because that's what we make, or um, just lending, lending voice and ideas to um, building the community. Absolutely. Thank you, Sierra. Matt, what about Creature? I would say in direct opposition to everything you just said, Sierra, um, when you start much more recently than 40 years ago, there was this model, there was this reputation, certainly within our, within our industry because of Sierra Nevada and Allagash and so many others, <clears throat> but also outside of craft beer, I mean, the Patagonias and Toms and Bombas and, and on and on and on, all these businesses that our founders were very aware of and part of the reason, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but part of the reason our three founders left what they were doing, which were more established careers to try something new is because they saw this opportunity to take everything that they were learning, of course, within their previous roles, but also just in the world of business and CSR and saying, we, we want to figure out what that looks like for us. And so that is really all to say, our three founders, they... They return in many cases to Athens to start Creature Comforts, and they recognize that right out the gate, they didn't know what it was going to be, but they were asking themselves the question, okay, what is our plan to support the city we love? Um, again, how are we uniquely as a craft brewery, how are we positioned to, to impact people? It's going to look different, obviously, for a craft brewery than it will for a, a car dealership or a tech company or a yoga studio or whatever but they were committed to figure that out. And you know, to the question, how did it start? It was really just like anything. It, we, we wanted to start somewhere and start small. And what we recognize, and this is, I suppose, any organization, is that there's generally some sort of combination of time that you have to leverage, perhaps some space, probably a little bit of money. Eventually, there's some combination of time, space, and money that every company can turn loose and um, for Creature Comfort specifically, before I guess we were in the black, it really started with leveraging our space. If you were to come to our tap room, it is in a very strategic location, geographically right in the heart of downtown of Athens. And so um, it looked like leveraging our, you know, allowing nonprofits during their annual um, fundraisers just to host their fundraiser at our place for free. Um, we struck out 
really, really quickly with a, a partnership, I guess you'd say, with the Athens Farmers Market, who at the time, they were paying somewhere else as a venue to set up shop every week and kind of same thing. Okay, we, we have space and we have a great location. If you just want to set up the AFM, the Farmers Market here, you can do that. And, you know, that was really the humble beginnings of, you know, it, we had it. We had a great space, and once we had money, <laughs> we started to mobilize that. And once we had a bit more of a staff um, that we could start, you know, figuring out what corporate volunteerism looks like, that has obviously flowered since then. But it really started quite small and quite simply back in 2014 for us. Well, I know that Sierra Nevada has been around a lot longer than Creature Converse, but the next question. It is still for both of you because I think that your approach to this kind of work can change pretty quickly. So, Sierra, I'll start with you first. How has your community development work changed over time? And what has informed the adjustments or enhancements? It started with just being members in the community and, uh, you know, Chico, where the brewery, Sierra Nevada, uh, our first location is located in Northern California was a very small community when we first began uh, our brewery here. So we started with, you know, the local bike clubs, but I think it was also, we were part of the founding <laughs> founding group because biking was another one of my father's passions at the time still is. Um, so there wasn't really that, that infrastructure there. So the community development began, I believe with us as part of that development. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're, we've, we, as Matt mentioned, you know, we have more of the finances and the space to help um, host some of the events for nonprofits or uh, money to support capital campaigns, whatever it is there. Whereas before we didn't have that, um, we helped to develop nonprofits and, you know, come up with what are the, some of the programs. Uh, so I, I think for us that um, development has shifted from being on the ground up to being able to support in a different way uh, than we were able to then. And also what community is. We were very insular with Chico, that was our, our landscape in California. And then over the 40 years, as we've grown, our definition of community has grown. So it's, um, it's not just our local backyard. It is of course our local backyard, but it's also the world around us. Uh, and then as we've been able to expand and uh, build a brewery in North Carolina, our community got a, a lot bigger overnight, just, just with that there. Um, and then I would also say having more focused programs for those communities, uh, where we have set criteria or areas that we feel that we can impact through sustainability, through economic development, um, more specific topics than blanket uh, support, though that is still there. Um, I, I think as we've identified areas where we feel we can make impact, that has focused um, our, our giving and participation. Absolutely. I love that concept of expanding your definition of community because ultimately, I mean, everywhere is local to some, some, someone or somewhere. So thank you for sharing that. Matt, what about Creature? Um, I mean, since 2014, I would say the main difference in terms of, you know, then and now is that we actually have programs. <laughs> we, we do have officially four what we just call community impact programs that are all connected in terms of their unified strategy, but they all have slightly different applications or emphases. Um, the main one of which is really what has brought us together today, which is the Get Comfortable program. That was the first that really still is the flagship. Um, but I mean, and we can talk more about Get Comfortable, of course, but I would say the major shifts that have taken place in the last seven years is really, I would say around two areas. One, how we as a company go about uh, agency or cause selection that has that has been enhanced over the years. We need the guidance of local leadership to steer our resources where they will, will matter the most. And so in terms of the program Get Comfortable, we today have an advisory council uh, comprised of representatives from our local government, United Way, our community foundation, um, really I guess the project in our city that is stewarding our 20 year comprehensive plan known as Envision Athens, the Athens Wellbeing Project, including one Dr. Grace Bagwell Adams um, speaks into that as well. But that is all to say, we wanna understand what are the community priorities already? Most communities already know what the biggest disparities are and what the biggest emphases should be. 
Um, so we start there and over that, over top those priorities, we un want to understand where are the disparities? What is the needs assessment data really steering us toward? And once you know that, you can start to select areas of greatest impact. And from that, you can start selecting agencies that are doing the most toward those areas. So agency selection, I would say over the years has gotten quite a bit more robust, really just by opening the doors um, to local leadership to speak into what great stewardship looks like. That's been shift number one. Shift number two um, has been about the recognition that, and Sierra can speak a lot more to this, I, I would imagine, um, there's something really fascinating and fantastic about breweries and beer as gathering spaces. I mean, if you look back millennia, the, the pub, the tavern has been this cross section of humanity where people come together and in the best of circumstances, they exchange ideas. And so that is really all to say, we recognize as a craft brewery trying to maximize impact, we had this fantastic opportunity to serve as a bit of a lightning rod of activity. Um, that is specifically to say, we are looking to, through Get Comfortable, uh, channel the generosity of many towards the most pressing needs. And by many, that means certainly our customers and people who kind of give through Creature, but also increasingly other local businesses who also want to maximize their impact, but perhaps don't have um, a strategy yet. So, I mean, as of the end of 2020, there was officially 63 different businesses, different local businesses who are all giving through this campaign called, called Get Comfortable. And that that collective impact, that concentration of resources, we have found to be very catalytic in this county. And that's just something that we've kind of discovered and unfurled over the years. So agency selection and the concentration of resources have been the primary, I guess, enhancements or adjustments to what um, community impact looks like since 2014. I think that's a great segue. Sierra, did you have something to add? So when I mentioned the different definition of community, in 2018, we had uh, the Camp Fire, which was California's most deadliest uh, fire in history, uh, lost uh, almost 100 lives. Um, but really, it was the devastation and the land, an entire town was completely devastated. Um, which prompted us to launch uh, our brewing of resilience. And with that, we invited all craft brewers across the United States. And then actually it ended up being a few uh, in Australia and New Zealand who joined us. But we ended up having over 1400 craft breweries come together and brew a beer and, and, and sell that in their local community there, but then do donate the sales of that to us um, for the recovery of our region here. So is that, that bringing together of the craft brewing community for our local community and that to me was just beautiful um, but through that brewing of resilience we raised 8.4 million dollars to directly donate back to our community here and which is awesome but then when you get 8.4 million dollars what do you do with it it's a lot harder to put that money thoughtfully back into a community than it seems like it should because I, I don't, you know, I'm one person and, and I don't know where the needs are. Um, and so we actually created very similar to what Get Comfortable is. Uh, our own local community group came together and created the Butte Strong Fund. And it was working with our community foundation and then bringing together a board of advisors. It's, you know, someone who knows about the uh, social emotional wellness, someone who knows about housing, someone who knows about um, you know, the, the resources that are going to be needed at uh, the economic, social, environmental level to help direct where those, um, that, that money is going. And it also allowed our group to then leverage and get other folks to donate in. You know, Matt, you mentioned you had 63 businesses, I think, in your area there. I don't know how many we had here, but it, it allowed us to, to match and, and make that money go a whole lot further. Um, and I, I, you know, I think we raised almost sixty million dollars because of that. It, you know, and it was a collaborative effort. And it's a drop in the bucket when you look at what the needs are for this community. And you know, we're two years later, and COVID didn't help any. Um, but it was that bringing together of community on so many different levels that has allowed us to to create and build um, a hyper local uh, thoroughfare, I guess, for recovery. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what I'm observing 
by talking to both of you and just some of the um, reading that I did about your brewery, um, Sierra, before this chat, you know, there's a big parallel between the approach that both of you have taken, not just with the advisory group, but also with trusting a community foundation to really kind of be the financial steward of some of the funds. And um, I think that's just an incredible lever and resource to be able to pull um, because I've heard Sarah McKinney at Local to Athens, our own Athens Area Community Foundation president, she always talks about how community foundations have the bandwidth to really invest and think about 100 years into the future, not just four or five years into the future. So I think that's a wonderful parallel between the two of your approaches. I think um, I'd love to hear your thoughts now then, sort of segueing from that, about what authentic community engagement really looks like um, when it comes to each of, not just you and your personal and professional lives, but the work and the engagement that your company's doing. So what, what does that authenticity look like? How do you know when you've got it right? So here, I'll start with you again. I, I don't know if you ever know that you have it right. I, mm -hmm. I think um, for me, authenticity is an end result of being true to yourself and being true to your values. And we are part of the community. We are a member of the community. And unless you're engaged in that community, giving what you can and um, supporting where you can, I, I don't think it's gonna be authentic in any way. If you're just um, throwing money or time or your name at it, to me, that's not necessarily authentic. That might be what, though, I, I, oh, let me just correct myself there. That might be what someone has to give and that's great. But if they're doing that just for recognition, to me, that's not necessarily authentic. Um, great that they're leveraging the resources there, but I think, um, you know, you're, you are a member of the community and your passion should be there to support where you can, and it's uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, I think understanding the why behind the engagement is what I'm hearing, one of the things. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think community engagement when done, when done well involves getting out of your silo, whatever your silo is. Um, this is perhaps cliche, but I, I sincerely love the African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so I, I would say if you organization individual are trying to figure out how to help without if you're doing that alone, if you're doing that in isolation, you're probably not engaged with your community. Um, I mean, it speaks so much to why we have developed the structure that we have for like a good comfortable is we want by definition, this not to be self-guided. We want it, we want it, you know, collaborative. We, we want to understand from people who have dedicated their careers to understanding these complexities. Um, what serving actually looks like. I mean, there's entire books written about this stuff um, with titles like When Helping Hurts, <laughs> Toxic Charity, um, and, and so forth. So we recognize that if we, are, if we are working in our silo, we are probably not engaged with our community. And so we have sought every way we know how to kick down the doors and pull down the silos and try to be working in tandem with others. Uh, other philanthropists, of course, but also local leadership to help us understand how we are helping and how we may not be helping. So I think it looks like that. But um, I, that second question, how do you know when you've gotten this right? There's a fantastic book that I believe just came out last year, if not 2019. I love a good resource. It's called Know What You're For. Know What You're For. And it's essentially a marketing book, um, but it's it's better than that. <laughs> um, the the guiding idea is your organization, for profit, nonprofit, whatever. It's known for it's known for something. You are known for something, and so the entire kind of thrust of this book, know what you're for, is what? Okay, before you get there, what do you want to be known for? Your organization should have an answer to that question. What do we want to be known for? And then question two, what are you actually known for? And there's probably a gap between what you want to be known for and what you're actually known for. And here are ways to close the gap so that when you hear people talking about you or your organization, your company, 
when they don't know that you're a part of it, what they hopefully say about you is what you dream for others to say about you. So um, I think you know you're getting this right when, when what you are known for is what you want to be known for when you've closed that gap, just to use some of that verbiage from the from a great book. So that really builds the bridge to the last question that I have. And it's, you know, the both of you have talked about your industry and it's really clear that you believe that there's something really special about the craft brewing industry in terms of collaboration, support, giving back. And so I think, you know, for our audience, it would be really helpful for you to talk a little bit about um, what recommendations you might have for other companies and, and in particular other industries um, who might be seeking to leverage their force for good, right? Um, because in some sense, it's completely counterintuitive to why a firm exists. I mean, economics 101, what do you learn? It's about profit maximization, right? So, um, you know, putting that little policy economics hat that I have on for a second, I just, it's really fascinating to me and encouraging and empowering when you observe companies who seemingly are supposed to just exist for profit, engage in building up their communities and giving that away, um, giving away some of their hard earned profit. So I, I just want to hear what advice you have, um, for other, for other companies. And I'll go in reverse order this time. Matt, you start off. Um, I'm just going to parrot some of the things I've already said, uh, start somewhere, start small. Don't wait until you have the perfect, perfect, perfect plan in order to launch it. Because especially, you know, depending on if you're in that still those startup years of a company or perhaps you're just in a season where maybe there's not a lot of margin in terms of financial or time resources or whatever. Um, if you wait until it's perfect, it's kind of like having a child. You're probably going to wait forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you feel totally prepared, you know. Thank you, Matt. Sierra, what do you have to share? Um, I like the start small. I think that, yes, you, you got to start somewhere. And if you start, um, you know, the sky's the limit. And so sometimes that can be overwhelming. So I, I, I do like that start small. I also would say look internally. So look at your culture, look at the culture maybe you want to, to build as a company and um, build on that. So, you know, we all have this one life to live at, that we know of, and uh, we want it to have meaning and feel gratified in, in what we do day in and day out. And I, I think looking to your employees and looking to yourself and what is it that you're going to find gives value and, and make, find a way to have it be synergistic to what you're doing for your, your profit and um, find a way to maximize that. Um, it's a big world and there's a lot of ways to participate in it. And uh, I, I would just say, yeah, start small and look to your company culture to help guide what it is that you feel that you can engage in that way. All right. Thank you so much. And with that, that closes all the questions that I have today for our community panel. I just want to thank you both and thank the audience for tuning in with us. Take care. We're, we're joined together today with um, two of uh, the leaders in two leading craft beer brands um, nationwide. Uh, Jeff from the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company and Fenwick from Creature Comforts. Um, hello to both of you today. Um, our goal is today is just to have a kind of free flowing conversation about the issues surrounding diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice as it pertains to organizations in the craft brewing space. Um, I personally um, have been in, working in the space for quite a while um, by way of introduction. Um, my name is Jay Jackson Beckham and I'm the principal of an organization called Crafted for All. We are a consultancy that helps craft beverage organizations develop more inclusive, equitable, and just organizational practices. Um, this organization recently, um, we've entered into partnership with the Brewers Association, um, who's been a longtime client. Um, and um, through that partnership, I've now stepped into um, more or less a full-time role um, as the equity and inclusion partner of 
Brewers Association directing their internal and uh, external DEI work. Um, so um, great to see both of you again. I've had the wonderful opportunity of meeting you both uh, in the past, but I will hand it over at this point and ask you two to provide us with some introductions. I'm uh, Jeff White and I'm the uh, CEO of Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Um, and uh, I would say that we um, are uh, really at the very beginning of our uh, formal DE&I journey uh, as a company. Um, and uh, um, so uh, one of the things I think that is uh, very consistent in Sierra Nevada's history, we've always been a company that tried to do everything ourselves. Um, going back from the very beginning, Ken Grossman literally built this brewery by himself, or our first brewery, and that's the way we've done things. And, um, and in this instance, we realized that in order to do uh, the best work we could, um, really the best way to go was not to do it just by ourselves but to get help um, and to get assistance and get guidance. And that's where we met Dr. J um, and she is uh, helping us um, along or helping us help ourselves along the way of this journey. And uh, so my name is Fenwick Broyard. I'm the vice president of talent and culture at Creature Comforts Brew Company. And uh, I'll say similarly to Sierra, we are also at the sort of uh, nascent stages or nascent phases of our um, DEI work at uh, at Creature, um, recognizing, of course, that some of the work that we have historically done, in particular, the Get Comfortable program and the ways that that has impacted our community, we, I think, probably like Sierra, would like to think of that as sort of a precursor to more intentional DEI work that we'll be doing internally at the brewery um, and, and, and among our workforce. But um, really excited about some of the amazing work that's being done in this space and the chance to partner with folks like Dr. J and Garrett Oliver and Tio and Benny over at uh, Crown and Hops and just seizing this moment right now where there's a lot of energy and attention around the need for diversity, equity and inclusion and justice inside of the craft brew space and really encouraged. Uh, that Sierra's on this call with us that y'all are walking along the same journey and that we can think of you guys as, as partners as we do this work together. Awesome. Um, thank you both. Um, so I have some kind of structured questions that I'll ask um, both of you, um, but please let it run free. Um, so tangents, um, welcome and um, open conversation, welcome. Um, but I'll start us off with, with a bit of a question. Um, so in 2018, um, I first joined the Brewers Association as their diversity ambassador. And um, very quickly, there was a lot of um, questions, right? Attention, I got a lot of trade and even kind of broad, broader media attention saying, okay, what is this about? Uh, and um, two questions kind of rose to the fore in all of the conversations that I had in the beginning. Um, the number one question I was asked is how bad is the problem, right? Um, and uh, the second question was uh, essentially like, what are the top three things organizations can do? Um, and I found very quickly that I um, hated both of these questions. Um, <laughs> one, Me because too. if there were three things that everybody could do, like we'd already have done them, right? Um, if it was that easy as checking that box. Um, but the, the first one particularly bothered me because I felt like um, I hate problem-centered approaches to thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. These are all four extraordinarily positive social forces. And to frame them simply as problem response, crisis response, uh, you know, compliance mindset, like all of those things drove me absolutely nuts. And so I have been fighting for years to kind of frame this conversation in this space of opportunity. Um, so I wanted to ask the two of you to start first by just speaking to that. Um, what does formalizing this effort mean for your respective organizations in terms of making and seizing opportunities? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think yours is a really wonderful reframe, Dr. J. I think you're absolutely right that the sort of reactionary approach to this issue is not the one that's going to translate into the long-term change that I think we're all interested in seeing. And 
um, people tend to recoil at the idea that there is something that they have to do in a way that makes amends for something that they perhaps should have been done been doing in the beginning, right? So like taking that approach, I think, tends to throw folks on the defensive. But uh, to your point, I mean, I, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity in this space, both in terms of the business opportunity that exists for the brewery when it opens itself up to additional markets, which happens sort of um, unintentionally even as more diversity is added to the workforce. Those individuals have family and friends who then get introduced to the brands. Those brands then circulate among communities that at this point may or may not be familiar with the, with the brewery itself. So there's a business opportunity for the, the, the entity itself. At the same time, I think that craft breweries in particular really do, and, and, and my very short experience in the craft space has revealed to me that what I knew to be true before I even joined it formally was that craft really does represent a wonderful opportunity for professional development and wealth development for individuals who are blessed enough to enter into this space. And so in as much as we are sort of in the midst of like a gold rush period in craft, that this is a time for us to pull in folks who would who, who stand to gain the most from riding such a wave and creating space at the table for them to come in and to participate in this growth. I know we talk about all the time that um, Creature in and of, I mean, we, we've got people in my office, I run the talent and culture department, which is our way of referring to HR, but I've got folks in my office who are able to attest to the fact that over the last several years, they can't even count the number of home loan applications that they've been able to sign off on for people who've come and started working for our company. And so recognizing the life change that a job at this entity represents for people, we are really leaning into the opportunity that that presents for members of our community to come and join our workforce and to benefit from this growth that we're undergoing right now so that they could, I mean, we're talking about the ability to change generations of families. We do a lot of charitable work and that charitable work definitely makes an impact in our community. But when we want to go from like charity to sort of solidarity and go from sort of providing, writing checks to like really creating means and opportunities for people to build wealth among their families, that's where we see leaning into diversity, equity, and inclusion as important work for us to be doing so that we can start changing lives on an even deeper level. Uh, uh, Sierra Nevada um, and why I wanted to be here so much. And what's very, very true is for, for everybody that works here, this is personal. Um, this isn't just a company and a job. And I think the, you know, the origins of craft beer were just that. And it's why craft has been so collaborative mm -hmm. is because it's deeply personal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is about, it represents all of us. And, and I think what we came to realize was we weren't representing ourselves as well as we wanted to be represented. And from a practical business perspective, you know, it is, it is my sincere belief um, and our ongoing practice, um, and by practice, we have a lot of practicing to do, that collectively we are more creative, we are smarter, and we are more effective than we are individually. And the more robust and diverse that collection, we're going to be a better business and we're going to be prouder of the business we are. Mm -hmm. And it is going to more represent our personal values as well as what we think are, are um, appropriate values worldwide. So it's really, I think, access, uh, accessing um, how deeply personal it is for us is, is a kind of our strength. And, and that's where we're, tr that's what we're trying to harness here. Um, I think for those of us who've spent, uh, I haven't spent quite as much time in craft beer as Jeff, but uh, I've, you know, I've been around for about two decades now. And, um, you know, I think there are very transformational experiences that I can point to. And those are the ones that kind of fuel the work that I'm doing in the industry now. And um, that honestly kept me around when I was showing up at festivals or beer dinners and being like, I am the only one of me here. Um, so, you know, I I just wanted to kind of throw that back out there. Like, um, either personally, you know, what are the transformational experiences that you have had? Or as someone who is who may be like an engineer of a transformational experience for someone else, where where are your where are your ideas and your excitement? Mm. Um, the uh, the murder of George Floyd was uh, a transformational moment um, where I hope, let me put it this way, I hope it's a lasting transformational moment. 
Um, I'm not going to give myself the slack of saying it is. Um, and, and what happened quite literally was like um, the rest of hopefully, like many, many, many people, I, I was outraged, just absolutely apoplectically outraged. Um, and uh, I was just I was in my house and I was just pacing and ranting and I was angry. And I caught a, a view of myself in, in the bathroom mirror. And uh, boy, I was taken by how, um, how full of sort of rage I was, full of outrage I was. And then I stopped and I literally asked myself, great, where was your outrage three months ago? <laughs> where was your outrage three years ago? So where the hell is your outrage going to be three months from now? What are you going to do with this? Where's your outrage going to be three years from now? And, um, and they calmed down. Uh, and for me, that was a transformational moment. That was a commitment moment. In the company, I think the biggest, the most uh, important thing we've done to date was we started this as a leadership team uh, initiative. Um, yes, we all believed we should do something and we had work to do and it was going to be top down. And, and then we got together and we were being professional about it. Dr. J was a witness to this. I think the most important thing we've done, which will be transformational, is we said, no, 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 this needs to come from the inside out. Um, we need to be led um, much like or very similar to bringing in Dr. J to help us along the way. Um, if we want this to be deeply personal and felt and owned by the company, um, it needs to come from the company. And so as a leadership team, uh, we've turned to a group um, and committed to them that you bring forward ideas and we will implement them. Um, and again, we're early on, um, but I think that particular change of mindset and approach will um, will really pay off for us in the future. Yeah, similarly, I, I suppose I'll speak from a professional perspective in terms of the transformation that I think is underway at Creature right now. Um, similarly to what Jeff just, just described, I think the BLM movement, the sort of uprising in the last, over the course of the last year in response to George Floyd and all the other individuals who lost their lives, many at the hands of law enforcement really did hasten a sort of wake up call moment, uh, a little bit of introspection on the parts of folks over across the country, but I think in particular inside the industry. And, and uh, I, I, I know I can say that that is true for Creature as well. I won't speak for Chris necessarily, but I know that similar to, to what Jeff described, Chris was not interested in Creature being involved in any sort of transactional one-off response to this problem that is now that had now been lifted to everyone's attention. It, 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 it sort of felt, I guess, like a, we better not throw stones from a glass house kind of situation, like that it forced everybody to take a good hard look at themselves. It's like, wow, you mean, yeah, there's discrimination in all these spaces and these folks are being discriminated against. And then you look around, you're like, wait, have we been doing that too? Like we are now up to, a hundred employees and none of them at this current moment are black. Like what, what the hell has happened here? Um, and I think in, in, in defense of, you know, Creature, and I'm imagining this is the case for many breweries, many craft breweries, uh, especially so, so those who are sort of early in their, in their term, in their tenure, um, the growth just happened so fast. And I think necessarily when businesses are being started, the individuals who start those businesses tend to lean into their own social and personal networks and professional networks. And then those people lean into their professional networks. And then before you know it, you got this really awesome, very tight knit culture of folks who tend to you know, look the same and have similar backgrounds and experiences to each other. And so I think in the moment, recognizing that as a problem though, really is what I think is kind of distinguishing what, what it sounds like Jeff and the folks at Sierra are doing and sort of what we're doing at Creature as well. It's like, yeah, I mean, we could write checks to organizations and we absolutely do that, but we think there's a lot more that we could be doing so as to make sure that we're not being hypocritical in our assessment of what's going on in the world around us and then not applying any of that critique to ourselves. And so um, we, 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 like you, Jeff, I mean, we took a good look at sort of who we thought we were as well. I mean, the purpose of Creature Comforts, right, is to foster human connection. Um, but then when we looked at the types of 
people we were connecting. And then also, Jay, to your point, the types of connections that were taking place between those people, the homogeneity of those connections did not translate into a ton of transformational work happening. And so there's an opportunity for us to really encourage transformational interactions taking place both within our, the walls of our, our brewery and, 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 and inside of our workforce, but then also between us and some of the folks who, who consider themselves members of our extended family, the folks who who, uh, who love Creature Comforts beer and, and, and make their way to our tasting rooms. You know, so a lot of the things that you two have both been talking about um, for me are kind of at the core of like change management processes, right? Um, uh, whether you're talking about DEI or not. And I think for me, get, as a the kind of um, role that I have in the industry, um, you know, one of the hardest things that I find in my work is that like, I am trying to help groups um, lead a change management process when first, they may not be comfortable with change management in general. And second, um, this is a wholly foreign direction for that change management to head in. Um, so as, as you know, both of you, I kind of know some, something about your professional backgrounds, and I suspect you have been involved in change management and leading change management in the past. So I'm wondering if you could just provide some like lessons. What, what have you learned? What can you suggest um, for anybody who might see this in terms of like what works in change management and what maybe does not work? Yes. So I used to have inside my notebook um, the, uh, you would open it up and the first page taped to the inside every time I had a new notebook was the steps of change management. And, and what I would tell people is, you know, you don't sit there and go, okay, what stage are we in? Or, or historically, I have not done that, but I could look back on any change initiative project, whatever, and go, this is what we did well. This is what we did wrong. This is what we missed. This is where we went sideways. You know, here's where the gaps are. And so um, sort of traditional change management is, um, and from my business school uh, experience, one of the most practical academic things I learned. So the two, the three things that jump out to me in, in uh, change management that are uh, critically important, certainly articulating the, the objective, but um, it's what I call building the coalition of the willing. It's that core team that that is bought in and uh, not just any, it can't be just anybody, you know, you want people that have some amount of influence, but they need to own it. And so building that coalition of the willing that you will expand from that will help drive this thing is, is really important. Um, the other one, which I look forward to us starting on very soon, I hope, is creating even manufacturing short-term wins. You need success begets success. And success begets optimism and will allow people to reach farther once they know we can do this. And so building those short-term wins and communicating them out as short-term wins uh, is really important. And, and uh, I, you know, I know I'm hungry for that right now. Uh, and the last is really the final step in change management, which, which is embed the changes in company culture just to make them happen. If you don't embed it in your culture, uh, you know, in some parts of change management, it's documented, but this needs to become not a project that you've done, um, but a change you've made, and it needs to be ongoing. And so those are the, the three steps, the coalition of the willing, the short-term wins, and then make sure you hard code this into your culture. It becomes who you are, as opposed to something you've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll... I'll... I, actually, I'd love that you went first, Jeff, because you kind of set me up to talk about the process that we're sort of currently engaged in right now at Creature, which is directly in alignment with those stages that you just outlined. We have um, sort of internal to Creature a process that we take multiple that we take all of our departments through. That we call the council group process. Um, the goal of which is to really get down to the, the the specifics of what each of these departments exists to accomplish. What is the purpose? What is the mission? What are the values of that department? What's the strategy that department's going to pursue past strategy? What are the action plans? What are the priorities with measurable objectives? And so we undertook the work of a council group and, and to speak to your point of getting securing buy-in company-wide, like 
we pulled together a cross section of our company, including members of our senior leadership team, all the way down to frontline staff and made sure that we had all of those voices represented. We had a nice blend of genders. We don't have a ton of racial diversity yet, but we're on our way. Uh, but we made sure that we had solid representation in that council group process. And again, the point of that was to get down to starting with the answer to the question of why are we even doing this? So that we're not occupying a sort of reactionary, well, because everybody else is, right? It's like, no, can we connect this back to who we are as a brewery? Um, and ultimately what we came back with in terms of developing a purpose statement for our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy was a play on our actual purpose statement for the brewery. The brewery's purpose is to foster human connection. The purpose for our DEI work is to broaden human connection. So taking that pithy statement and then using that as the lens by which we evaluate everything else that we do as we start to, as we continue to do this work. Um, I think it's key, and you've already sort of alluded to this as well, just like that idea of benchmarking, I think is important as well, sort of where are we now? Um, so that we can actually have some measurables. I love the United Way of America had a mantra that I used to echo, I used to repeat all the time, what gets measured gets done, what gets measured gets done. Um, and we have taken that approach and applied that to this work of diversity, equity, inclusion at Creature. And, and you know, that sort of like benchmark snapshot isn't always a pretty one. It's like, okay, cool. Like where we, where we are right now might not be something we're excited to have to report to ourselves, but it's good for us to get a baseline so that we can mark track our progress over time. So we've got that benchmarking and then we set some clear targets for ourselves with some timelines um, and are now my department and, uh, and myself included, we're being held accountable for that. So all of the folks who participated in that council group get regular reports from my team as to how we're delivering against those objectives that we collaboratively developed that my team now has ownership of, uh, but that everybody got a chance to participate in determining what we were gonna pursue and how we were gonna go after it. And now they provide support to us in pursuing those goals. But I think that idea of buy-in across, getting some good benchmarks, setting some targets, um, and then really, like, to, like you said, I mean, we, weaving it into the DNA of the organization itself is, is essential. And so the fact that we undertook a process similar to those that we do for actual departments, and this is not diversity, equity, and inclusion is not a department at Creature, but we thought it an important enough undertaking that we treated it as one and took it through the process that we take whole divisions of our company through so as to set some clear objectives for ourselves. Um, thank you both for, for this conversation. It's been um, both enlightening and helpful for me. Um, you know, I think that as a the conversation continues to move forward, I'm struck by a number of, um, for me, a number of the most encouraging and hopeful realities of, of the industry that we, um, you know, are lucky enough to be in by nature of like the way the industry is oriented and the fact that we can provide um, employment for anyone, whether they have a PhD or a GED, um, um, that we are, we are so well poised to be um, engineers of positive change, um, of wealth development, of um, you know, personal transformation as employers, um, or even as just people, you know, giving people a way to interact in the world through the kind of you know, proximate senses of taste and smell that like just add joy, right, to the world. Um, and so, you know, as I con converse with leaders like you all in the industry, I, I just want to take a moment to kind of recognize the gratitude I feel that we're involved in the work we're involved in, because I think um, we have like a bigger lever than, than we've ever really <laughs> um, stood up to use. Um, but I think as 2021 unfolds, um, more and more people are stepping up to do that work, um, including Sierra Nevada Brewing Company and Creature Companies. And so um, I thank you. All right, so I'm gonna dive in. Uh, so my name is Kevin Kershey. I serve as Director of Sustainability at the University of Georgia. And it is a true honor and pleasure for me to connect uh, with a couple of my heroes in sustainable business and the craft brewing industry. Um, tell us your role in your company, how that relates to sustainability, and what drives you to engage in this meaningful work. Uh, Mandy, can we start with you? Sure. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that intro. Um, so yeah, my name is Mandy McKay, and I'm the Director of Environmental and Social Responsibility for Sierra Nevada. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we've, sustainability um, has really been at our core from day one. So for 40 years, we've really had a, a 
authentic commitment to, you know, operating responsibly. And that certainly includes the environment and the people that work for us and in our communities. Awesome. Thank you. Adam, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks for having us, Kevin. Um, my name is Adam Beecham. I am the brewmaster and one of the co-founders of Creature Comforts uh, here in Athens. Um, so that means I'm, I'm basically in charge of production activities in the quality lab. Um, you know, so we're you're the largest user of uh, resources generally uh, in a brewery is the people you know folks make beer. Um, so a lot of those, a lot of that part of what Creature Comforts is about falls within production, most of it. All right, Jacob, you're up. All right, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jacob Yarbrough. I'm a sustainability specialist at Creature Comforts. Um, I'm also a member of our production team. Uh, so I have my hands in coordinating our sustainability program and making our beer. So I'm really excited to be chatting uh, with all of you guys today about sustainability and moving forward in this industry. What are some specific strategies that you've been able to put in place to reduce water, energy waste, or carbon emissions? Uh, and what are some opportunities that perhaps you'd like to pursue in the future? We have really excelled um, and kind of fallen back on this philosophy of closing loops. Um, and it's really proven to be a wonderful operating philosophy and strategy for thinking about zero waste, water, energy. Um, and so those are some of the things that I think we really lead the way on. And we've proven that you can, you know, think, think about loops. So there's, there's waste isn't, um, you know, something that you don't even think about it. It's actually what, what's that resource for another process or can, can something that's coming out of one process go back in. So we've done some amazing things with heat recovery, water recovery, um, CO2 recovery. So this idea of like, if something's leaving a system, yeah, it's a byproduct of that particular process, but it's actually probably a resource for something else. Or waste heat is a really good example, especially in a brewery. Um, we make a lot of heat, we use a lot of heat. Um, we're very energy intensive in the brewing process. And so heat is something we've really um, kind of gone all, all in on, um, recovering heat, steam. Um, so I think we've done a really good job there. And I think that closed loop philosophy, again, has really been a nice guiding operating philosophy for us. What I'm looking forward to doing more on in the future, um, we've been very inwardly focused. We've been very operationally focused. We still have work to do, but we've done some really great things there with zero waste and lead certification and on-site energy generation and heat recovery, like I mentioned. Um, we do some amazing things. What I'm hoping to do more of is a broader strategy outside of our four walls. Um, whether that's through advocacy or partnerships or with our supply chain. You know, a lot of breweries and craft beer, they're small. Um, at worst, we're technically still small when you think of breweries that are much larger than us, right? But in craft beer, we're, we're larger than a lot of others. And so there's probably more we could do in our supply chain to further those sustainability efforts and start talking with suppliers and vendors more. So I'm really looking forward to more of, of that work and, and kind of thinking externally. And Frankly, we've learned a lot just from the way creature, our partnership with Creature Comforts. Um, you know, I think they are sort of the leaders in that community space um, and thinking kind of outside beyond themselves. And so that's been really cool just for me personally, just to learn more and work with them. And um, so again, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to doing moving forward is, is kind of beyond our four walls. I'd like to echo the point that Mandy was making about closing loops. Um, I think that this is kind of a fundamental idea uh, in all sorts of sustainable efforts of taking waste products, thinking about new uses for them, thinking about ways that they can kind of be uh, newly appreciated um, for the value that they have. Um, you know, heat recovery, huge thing. Um, water recovery, also great work. Something that um, has been a big part of our efforts, you know, we're still very much in the early goings on our sustainability program. We're still developing it, but I have just been very impressed with the value of just simply establishing benchmarking practices, uh, key performance indicators, you know, going from having nothing uh, to like just taking a look at your production output, taking a look at your utility usage and comparing the two. You know, you can get uh, rates of, you know, kilowatt hours per barrel, you can get rates of pound of CO2 per barrel, and then 
uh, from those, you know, it takes a while to build up a bank of data, but you can find insights on how you can make improvements, you can target those improvements. Uh, the Brewers Association, the national organization does a fantastic job of providing a tool for us to use free of charge, really easy to understand. Um, and we're able to upload our data and also compare uh, where we are sitting to uh, other breweries, both smaller than us, bigger than us, like the entire gamut. It's pretty fantastic to see. Um, so some of the things that we are working on, some strategies, you know, uh, we are working towards on-site power generation, um, hoping to have some solar panels going soon. Um, we're also uh, purchasing some renewable energy credits. Uh, speaking of closing loops, um, as we grew, uh, we increased the generation of our spent grain. Uh, spent grain being probably the number one waste resource from a craft brewery. Uh, the great thing about spent grain is that it's got another use for cattle ranchers. You know, it makes great supplementary feed. Um, so as we grew, um, you know, we found an arrangement where we were able to sell some of our spent grain uh, for a monthly revenue. And we took that monthly revenue and we turned it into purchasing renewable energy credits. And so that is kind of a cool loop where, you know, we have a waste product, you get a revenue from that waste product, and then you turn it into a resource for something else entirely, which is helping us get better at that renewable energy stuff. Um, so we're looking at all sorts of different things, you know, um, Going into the uh, benchmarking efforts, something that I've been working on pretty hardcore lately is uh, building out water usage diagrams. You know, we have, there's an old saying uh, that, you know, it's better to save water by drinking beer. It's completely false. It always takes more water to make a glass of beer than is contained within it. Um, and so we wanna be very responsible stewards of water usage. And so I've kind of tried to go through, identify like over the course of an entire year, like where our water usage is going, where it's coming from. And one of the great values of doing this work is that it helps us target improvements. So it's going from an idea of like, oh yeah, we need to get better at using water to, hey, we need to make sure that our brew house is rinsing properly and not going overboard. So taking, you know, good uh, ideas and turning them into target improvements has been very, very valuable for us. You, you seem to be collaborating outside of your four walls and with other breweries and, and very specifically, um, the two of you working together, um, not necessarily viewing each other as competitors, um, but uh, collaborators. Um, so I'd love to hear, uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, why why would you collaborate with another brewery as you strive to make the best beer as sustainably as possible? Um, and then more specifically, can you talk a little bit about some of the key considerations that went into the 2021 Get Comfortable uh, Double IPA collaboration that you've worked on? I cannot speak for other industries since I have not, I don't have long experience in other industries. Um, but I have heard from those that have, and then my own experience just being in the industry for over a decade, you know, craft beer is naturally collaborative. I don't know sort of necessarily why that is, and that, but it's awesome, right? And I think that's what draws a lot of people to the industry. Um, and we're, it's a unique industry in that, yeah, we're competitors. And, um, you know, I think everyone knows that, right? Like it's obvious, but there's not this like, there's knowledge sharing, especially in the sustainability world, especially in philanthropy and community um, sustainability like that. We all are, we're talking to the same audience. We're all the same consumers. We recognize that there's a wide, you know, birth of the population that we're all trying to reach and speak to. Um, and so I think if we work together, tide rises all boats, right? Like I think it's, there's this I just feel lucky to be part of an industry that really does get that inherently. And so the collaborations, I think it's just sort of a, a natural thing. And then specifically within sustainability, I have some of my you know closest colleagues are other sustainability people uh, at other breweries. And we, we share and we talk and we work together and um, we model each other's programs and I'm happy to be, provide resources. And then I learn from others. And so I think that's just really, really cool. And you, I think pretty unique to industry in general. So within craft, I think that's an awesome thing. Um, and then I'll um, speak more to maybe our, our collaboration and then I can join in. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, 
think collaboration has been a major part of craft beer for a long, long time. Um, and I, I, I think it was intentional really like back, you know, when it was like a, a very, um, you know, small group of folks uh, that were really up against some of the largest corporations in the entire world. Um, you know, that attitude of like, we can, we can sort of do this together and change the face of beer, change the world. Um, and it's been really the most inspiring thing to see continue through sort of, you know, somewhat industrialization of craft. Like we're, we're getting a lot bigger, but we still share tons of ideas all the time. It's amazing that it's, that it's still going. I mean, we, you know, our sales folks, they compete like out there in the world, like they're definitely scrapping for the same tap handles. But I think the sentiment that, you know, if we share information like with, with other amazing brewers, like it comes back around and the industry as a whole is stronger. Uh, I think, you know, for me, it really started with the idea of quality being, um, you know, if all craft beer is of higher quality, people are more likely to try craft beer and not be burned on it. And I started thinking about that and I was like, well, you know, sustainability ideas, God, if we all have amazing sustainability ideas, how much more impact is that gonna have on the, on the wider world? So, you know, there are a lot of amazing areas that we can collaborate and learn from each other. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, be great friends and, and sharing a lot. So it's, it's one of the cooler things about this industry. Um, that I, I continue to love. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the beer, I guess, um, and then maybe Jacob can clean up for me. Um, we've, uh, we, we've definitely uh, been focused on a beer that will sell very well. Um, this is our community impact brand, so uh, it, needs to, it needs to sell quickly. It needs to get people excited, you know, wholesalers, retailers, customers, everybody. Uh, through the line. So, you know, they tend to be IPAs, which is, uh, happens to be a competency of uh, Sierra Nevada's and our own as well. So I think it all fit nicely. Um, you know, haziness uh, certainly uh, helps a beer to sell these days. And I, I love hazy, hoppy beers. Um, we, you know, part of the story um, that I, I like to share as we've been going through this, um, I was really inspired when Sierra Nevada put a lot of weight behind uh, Citra coming to market back, you know, well over 10 years ago now. But I, I look at those kinds of things that serve the industry in a philanthropic way almost. So sure, I mean, Sierra Nevada is better for there being Citra in the world, but God, we are way better for there being Citra in the world and, you know, all time favorite hop. But, uh, you know, kind of highlight that, um, that industry specific force for good, force for change and progress um, by using Citra and then a potentially new and exciting hop in HBC 586, which, you know, we're hoping to maybe shed some light on as a, as a cool hop that will, uh, will become, you know, maybe get a name here soon um, and be exciting for folks. So um, I guess one other thing that kind of ties into sustainability too, um, we've been learning a lot from Scott Jennings and the team about, you know, their very efficient use of hops. Um, like really squeezing all of the flavor out of hops and not being wasteful um, with with hop, you know, oils and, and resins. So um, I think I think it's a beer that is going to fit very well with the message of of what this collaboration is all about, and I'm I can't wait to try it. So, so this next question is a little more focused on Mandy, but um, if others want to chime in, you know, feel free. Um, so. Creature Comforts, as you know, is um, gearing up to move uh, or expand and open a, a facility in California. Um, and Mandy, I know you've gone through the experience of opening a new facility um, in North Carolina with uh, Sierra Nevada. Um, it's a super impressive facility. I've had the opportunity uh, once and, and I look forward to another uh, time to, to go hang out there. Um, it's engaging and um, from a sustainability standpoint, um, it's, it's just really well done. You know, everything from simple, you know, additions like bicycle parking to solar arrays in the parking lot, um, organic farm and on-site wastewater uh, treatment. Um, how were you or Sierra Nevada able to keep sustainability top of mind throughout uh, every aspect of design and construction of your facility? Well, thank you for that. And I, I would agree. I've 
get to visit it, you know, non COVID times. Um, I usually get to go a couple times a year and it still blows me away. Like I love, I'm like, I'm just so impressed with it and it's absolutely gorgeous. And so I encourage everyone to make it there when, when we can, but, um, so yeah, thanks for that. And I, I think again, because of our leadership and our, you know, we're family owned and independently operated by Ken and his family. Still, I, you know, it was very important when we were researching new sites for a, a second brewery. Um, and then thinking about physically what the brewery looked and the experience was like, it was top of mind from day one to make sure that whatever, wherever we chose and whatever we built exhibited our values, who we are, what we stand for, what we think is important in operating a company. And it really, the intent was to, to showcase to a new audience. You know, we were prior to that brewery and really still, still we're a West Coast you know, people know us as a California based company. Um, we're not as well known on the East Coast. And so when we started looking at where to go and again, how to build, um, it was okay, these people don't know who we are, we have to show them we have to tell them. And so what's going to be front and foremost, well, it's going to be those things that we that we value and, and show how we operate as a company. And so from the from day one, um, lead certification was it wasn't even a conversation. It was like, yep, it's gonna, we're gonna at least do lead silver, right? And um, if you're not familiar, lead is leadership in energy and environmental design. So it's a building certification, but it also looks at how people are getting to and from your brewery and parking and transportation and windows and lighting and water recovery and all kinds of things. Um, so that was, that was just settled. There wasn't even a conversation that we we're gonna be lead silver minimum. And then as we worked on sort of the actual building and the design, pretty quickly it was like, well, what do we need to do to be gold? Or, you know, well, what else do we need to have? Or what would it take to do that? And, you know, before we knew it, it was like, no, if we're gonna go all in on this, let's go all in and, and we value these things. So we set our sights on lead platinum and we and we got it. And we're, I'm really proud of that because that what there was a lot that went into, it was very intentional at every um, engineering meeting and design meeting that was part of, of everyone was talking about can, how do we meet those credits and how does the customer going to feel and think and um, and then certainly the, the ge geographic location as well you know we're looking at things like what's the water quality like is there a good art and music scene um, you know are there is there outdoor recreation av available there so there was a, so much that went into that um, and and I think that's that's why it, you it, and we you know we had 40 years of experience to put into that. So you come to Chico, which this is where I'm based in Chico, California. This is my you know hometown. But um, you know we had a lot to learn <laughs> when we did learn a lot over 35 years that we were then be able to put in that. So uh, you know you, the the Chico brewery doesn't look anything like that. It's beautiful, but you know we've got like 17 different buildings instead of one beautiful efficient flow for brewing to go to packaging, um, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm very excited to see Creature come to California. And so, and to, again, just because of their leadership in representing themselves in to the community and what you stand for, um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what that's going to look and feel like. Your breweries do so much uh, in, in such tangible ways. Um, you're doing good for the environment and the communities that you serve. Um, can you just talk a little bit about uh, why you're proud of that legacy that you're creating um, and perhaps offer some advice for other organizations that may be looking to take a step in a sustainable direction? So our actions, both in the short term, the long term, whether intentional or unintentional, they become part of a record, our record as a company and as, as who we are as individual people. Um, and so the idea that the recognition of a legacy of our company and actions, it helps us make decisions that improve that legacy. You know, it's kind of intentional thought. It's kind of, um, you know, making ourselves and what we're doing just like better than what we have to do. Right, that's uh, something that we're going for is just like extra achieving more with what we've got. Um, and so, yeah, leaving a legacy is something that we're thinking about all of the time. Now for some advice for some other organizations, um, my number one piece of advice is don't be afraid to get started. Um, I am something of a perfectionist. Um, and when it comes to being a perfectionist, like I think I have like a fear of failure. 
right? That keeps me from going on some things, but um, like just getting started, doing something, doing anything is better than what you did yesterday. Um, so whether that's like super simple stuff, like, you know, taking a look at your utility bills and building up benchmarks or whether that's something big and complicated, like a lead platinum building across the country in the case of Sierra Nevada, like it begins somewhere and it doesn't begin until you begin it. Um, and so I think that that is like probably the most important piece of advice that I have is just like, just get going, get creative. Don't be afraid to fail. So uh, for me, we can, you know, we can give back, we can be good corporate citizens, and we can also build a thriving, you know, beautiful community of work, working people here. Um, so, yeah, I hope that when people look at Creature Comforts in many years that they, they see that and they're inspired to do it themselves. Um, so, you know, that, I guess that would be the main main part of the legacy. Jacob's had some great points around benchmarking. It's a phenomenal way to start. I guess I would just add, um, you know, sort of a little of what Mandy said. It's like, just plant a flag at some point at the beginning and say like, this is going to matter to us. Uh, we are going to spend some money on this at the outset uh, and try to, you know, try to hang on to, you know, what your commitments have been. Um, sometimes in, in the process of a build out, you know, things end up on the chopping block um, and you got to box it out for sustainability stuff. You have to look at operating expense. And that, you know, it's, it's real easy to get caught up in the moment when you're building something, say, like, we could lop that off right now. But if you just, if you guard against that encroaching into things that are going to be better for the environment, be better for the organization long-term as much as possible, um, then, you know, you're going to set yourself up. I don't know if I have much more to add to that other than um, I would totally second um, Adam, your comment about, you know, a business of uh, the profit side or the bottom line and being a responsible corporate citizen, absolutely not at odds. And if you, um, if you actually think about it more deeply, um, I would argue that it actually makes your company stronger and more, you know, it thrives more and it, it only grows. And there are so many examples of that. And we're, I feel we're living in a, in a great time. It's weirdly to say that right now, because I got a lot in my brain, but um, we're, we're part of a growing number of organizations and businesses that are recognizing the evolution of the business and what a business, what the, what a role of a business is in society. And it is no longer, um, you know, this expectation that businesses are just for shareholders or for profit or for making money and very industrial, like, um, you know, we've, we are moving past that. And I, I think it's a really good direction because businesses are so powerful in communities, in the work that we're doing. Um, we have very strong voices. Um, we hire people, uh, we make money, um, we live and work in communities. We can think about climate change um, and our impact on it. So businesses have an incredible role and opportunity to play. And, you know, I've, I've seen it, we're, we're watching that, that growing number of, of businesses embrace that and, and recognizing that there's a lot of power there, um, power to do good, and that that role of the corporation really, really evolving. And so, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be part of a company that has really always thought that way and Creature Comforts is the same and you're founded in that. Um, and you're, you know, you have a mission and values that help guide you, um, because that is that is what we're seeing, and we're seeing businesses really lead the way when when other entities don't, right? Um, and so, as far as legacy, I think um, again, just speaking for Sierra Nevada, because we're family owned and operated, I think naturally we've we and our leadership has been able to think that way because we're hope we're hoping to leave it for future generations, right? You know, it's. It's thinking long term. It's thinking generationally. It's not easy to do, um, but it kind of it takes you out of it. And I think Adam or Jacob said something also about this. Um, it's beyond you, right? You you are you have a great job. You work for a great company, um, but really the goal is to actually make things better for everybody and beyond you, after you, years after you. So I I I'm I'm proud of Sierra Nevada for that. And again, I think it's a I'm excited to see a growing number of businesses really recognizing their role. Um, and then for advice, 
I get that question a lot. And same, I think, do not let solar panels or heat recovery or composting or a new lead brewery. Those are amazing things. I'm so proud of them. But we started, you know, begging for our bottles back because we couldn't buy new bottles. And so we were reusing them and thinking very diligently 40 years ago about how to be resource efficient. And really, to me, I think efficiency in all its forms is like even better than generation or recycling. I mean, just, just use less, period. Like, and you don't need to buy equipment to do that. You don't need to, it's really just about looking at your, what you're doing and how can you reduce it? Um, and then going that next extra step for like, okay, what do we do with the stuff we can't reduce or where, how do we get solar on here to whatever? So I think starting small really is a big thing. And I think a lot of people lose sight of that basic zero waste hierarchy of reduce at the top, like just focus there and it'll go a long way in setting you up. Um, for all these future things. Thank you. Thanks for that advice that will be shared with others. And um, thanks for just reimagining um, the role of a business uh, as citizen and, and neighbor and the impacts that you have on your communities. Um, thanks for making great beer. Thanks for sharing your insights, um, for uplifting our communities and for uh, investing in this planet that we all call home. So it has really been a pleasure to, uh, to connect with you all. I look forward to um, imbibing in the 2021 Get Comfortable collaboration. Um, and again, it's really been uh, fun and a treat to get to hang out with you guys for a little bit. Thank you.